Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're glad you joined us this morning. Please stand, join us as we get ready to sing the solid rock. Psalm 18, 1 through 3 says this, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. We're going to lift up the solid rock into our great Savior this morning. Sing it out with us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ray, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Hallelujah, what a 
1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And Jesus accepts us just as we are. Sing out, just as I am. Just as I am. in the last century is just as I am for almost a hundred years not quite but half a century at least people came forward to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior in churches and evangelistic meetings to that song just as I am aren't you thankful that Jesus takes us as we are and makes us what we never could have imagined that we could have been we praise the Lord well let's open with prayer today we are so glad that you are here 
And uh, Dad, would you come and lead our, our open our service with prayer? Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here today. We're thankful for the opportunity to lift up our voices and worship you. We're thankful for those that are tuning in on the live stream this morning. Lord, we pray that you would just draw them as well as us closer to you by the time all is said and done. So be with the preaching of the word today. Bless the uh, special music. Help us as we continue to lift up our voices. Be with those uh, who may be traveling this weekend. Give them traveling mercies. Those who may be at work, help them to feel your presence there. Maybe some that are not feeling well, we pray your healing hand would be upon them as well. But thank you for all that you are and all that you do in our lives. Thank you for the cross, the precious blood that was shed some 2,000 years ago that we might have our sins forgiven and have eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I do want to welcome you once more. It's good to see everybody. Just a few quick announcements. You should see quite a few things listed in your bulletin this morning. There's some things coming up over the next uh, over the next few weeks. One of the things is this Wednesday night we have our guest speaker, Brother Rich Fulton, who's going to be with us at 6:30. And Rich was a missionary to Ireland for many many years, and he's going to be talking about his new ministry uh, with Rock of Ages Prison Ministry. So you want to come this Wednesday night to hear him. And of course tonight. We have our bonfire worship service. That'll be at my house, and everybody is welcome to come. Uh, we'll be starting at uh, 5 o'clock with games and activities, and uh, then we'll have a service at 6 o'clock, and then folks are welcome to stay longer as we enjoy the evening together. So come, bring a snack, bring a dessert, one or the other, bring both, whatever you'd like, and we'll have a good time tonight of fellowship and, um, and worship around the campfire. So that's this evening, 5 o'clock. All right, and then this coming Saturday, we will have our men and boys prayer meeting. We've had some wonderful prayer meetings the last few months, and I want to invite you to come out this Saturday at 8 o'clock. All right, very good. And then uh, in the month of July, we'll, we'll be launching our life groups. So keep an eye on the list that's over in your bulletin as well and get acquainted with those. We want everybody to be a part of a life group starting in just a month. Well, we've got um, a bit of a sad announcement today. It's, it's bittersweet, and that is that today is the last Sunday that Forrest and Natalia Houghton are with us. They are moving south to Texas, and um, we are going to be sad to see them go, but we're excited for them as they start a new chapter in their life. We're especially disappointed that you didn't have the baby here, but it's going to be a Texas baby, but uh, we're happy for you. And we just want to say as a church, uh, and tonight we'll have a little send-off for them at, uh, um, at our house. I think Natalia said, Forrest, we can't leave until after the Sunday night campfire service. So um, we're looking forward to that, um, but we'll have a send-off for them. And uh, they've been a blessing in a lot of ways, um, and we're, we're so thankful Natalia helped start uh, one of the women's groups that meets right now, and that, uh, that was a burden of hers. We appreciate that. And then Forrest has been just a huge help with all of our media, um, all things media, technology related. Um, he's really been a, a real blessing to our church. So make sure that either this morning after the service or tonight that you take a minute to uh, wish them Godspeed as we send them off on their way southbound to Texas. So congratulations, guys, and we will we'll miss you very much. All right, well, let's do this. We're going to prepare um, our hearts for our giving today. Um, we're so thankful that God has blessed us financially, and we're going to give back to Him. So as, uh, as we prepare to do that, some have given before the service, some will afterwards on the way out, some will give online. Um, but either way, we take a moment in the service to just settle our hearts and worship the Lord through our tithes and our offerings. So let's do that right now. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are thankful for your goodness in our lives. Lord, you've been good to us in so many different ways. Most of all, we are thankful for the spiritual riches we have in Christ Jesus. And Lord, you've also given us uh, possessions. You've given us money and jobs and, uh, and so many things that, that our brothers and sisters around the world don't even enjoy. But you've 
chosen to bless us with them. So, Lord, we want to be careful to be generous. We want uh, you to take our offerings and use them for the missionaries. We pray for our missionaries that you would uh, just further their work, that you would expand their reach, uh, bless them in their needs and in their struggles and in their victories, guide their churches and their families. And thank you that we can have a part in supporting them financially. And then for the needs of the church, we pray that uh, you'd continue to uh, provide all that we need. And we dedicate this offering today to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Men, let's stand once more. Oh, church, arise, put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now we me, say that they are strong in the strength that God has shield of faith and belt of truth will stand against the devil's rise and army know whose battle cry is love reaching out to those in darkness a call to war to love the captive soul but to rage against the Following the Shepherd, our series in the life of David. If you remember last week, we uh, moved a little bit out of order, um, not too much though, and we looked at David's mighty men. And uh, we enjoyed the example of those men and how God used them. To today, we pick it up in really the, the climax of David's kingship. So if you remember, and you have this on the study guide on the front, we're looking at David's life as a series of mountaintop and valley experiences like all of our lives are. And so as we do that, right now, um, we are in part number three. David's come from uh, the earliest stages of his life, learning about the Lord as his shepherd. And now then he, go, he went through the period of a dark valley where he's chased and hunted by Saul and now we're in this third major movement of his life where David is entering his kingship. He's right now walking in the blessings of God's promise. Do you notice something about that sequence? He knows the Lord. He's learning about the Lord. 
He goes through a trial, and then he comes out and experiences the blessings. And you find that sometimes you only really appreciate the blessings of God after he's brought you through a time of trial and difficulty. And that's exactly what's happened with David. And here he is now in chapter number 5, verse number 1. Let's look at it together. 2 Samuel 5 and verse number 1. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. They've united. They are his. They want no, uh, no one to doubt it, that they belong to David. They're loyal to the king. We are thy bone and thy flesh. Verse 2, also in time past when Saul was king over us, thou was he that led us out and, or led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 46 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, don't miss that, in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. Today, we go up to Jerusalem, and they always would say, go up to Jerusalem because it didn't matter. We think of up as in terms of north as opposed to south going down, but Jerusalem sat at 2,500, just over 2,500 feet above sea level. And so whenever they would come to worship in Jerusalem, because that's of course where the temple is uh, or was, when they would come to worship, they would always say, let's go up to Jerusalem. And they would climb the hills as they approached the holy city. Verse number six, but all that's in the future, because verse number six says this, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot Come in hither. There's no way, David, you will take our city. Well, let's have a word of prayer together. Lord, help us now as we study the scriptures. I pray that you'd make uh, the truths of your word abundantly clear this morning and help us to see the application. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would go before me, move in our hearts. I pray that our full attention would be focused on your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The march up to Jerusalem. This is the first, going to be the first major victory that David will experience as he is the king of a united Israel. Now we know of Jerusalem as the city of the throne of David. We know Jerusalem today and its modern significance. It, was, it had great significance over the last few years as our American embassy was moved into the city of Jerusalem. And we know that for thousands of years, Jerusalem has had such great significance. But this is actually the first reference to Zion. You'll see that in just a minute, that Zion is a reference to Jerusalem. In fact, look with me um, at 1 Chronicles chapter 11. Remember, we said, and this is in your handout, it's, there's, I, I have a typo in there, under the March to Jerusalem, it shouldn't be 1 Corinthians, it should be 1 Chronicles 11, so pay no attention to the reference, but there's, as we've been studying this, we said when we come to this point in David's life, you have to cross-reference what happens in 2 Samuel with what happens in 1 Chronicles, because there you have both uh, separate accounts of the same kinds of events. So you'll notice in 1 Corinthians, the same story, or 1 Chronicles, the same story is told in chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem. Can you imagine that procession as David is now the king? Remember, what was it that the, what the, that the men had just chanted together? They just chanted together, David, we are your bone and we are your flesh. 
we are your boat. I mean, not something that we say a whole lot nowadays. But I see these mighty warriors. They had been, they had been uh, feuding factions up until now. And they say, we are your bone and we are your flesh. Where will we go? And he leads a march. And David has had, I don't know what it was, but the Lord must have impressed on David's heart that there was a city that belonged to the Jebusites, but it really should belong to David and his kingdom forever. And that city was perched way up on a hill, and it was a fortress, and it had come to be known as Zion. Look at this verse. David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants said to David, thou shalt not come hither. Now, if you haven't figured it out, spoiler alert coming up. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. You can probably imagine how this is going to go. They say there's no way you can take this city. There's no way you can take this stronghold. But David takes it anyway, and he takes it in the name of the Lord. But they marched to Jerusalem, and you see that phrase there, David took the castle of Zion. That phrase, Zion, is often used as a reference to Jerusalem, the city of God. If you're going to be a serious student of the Bible, you need to understand the significance of this word, of this place called Zion. Now, Zion was actually a specific mountain within the city of Jerusalem. It's disputed today where exactly that mountain would be. And whether it is today, I believe that someday in the future it will be the, the actual site of the temple. That's my personal belief that that mountain will be the site of the temple that is uh, restored when Jesus returns in Jerusalem. But Zion is significant. So, as I said, it references a specific mountain within Jerusalem. But as the biblical literature unfolds, as you, in fact, you'll find the word Zion appears over 100 times in the scriptures. Over 100 times Zion is mentioned. This here is the first, very first mention. So, while it's a specific mountain, it also comes to reference all of Jerusalem. All of the city is thought of as Zion. It's very significant. You see, if you study it out through the Bible, if you study it out through the scripture, you'll find that Zion is thought of as the seat of the kingdom of David. Not only that, but it is the location. The city of Zion is the location of the temple. And eternally, Zion is the city of God. The Bible prophetically will speak of that eternal city, that eternal hope, that is Zion. In fact, the people of God would often sing the songs of Zion. And you'll actually find throughout Christian literature, not, not biblical scriptures, but throughout Christian literature over the years, references to God's people gathering together to sing the songs of Zion. And you may be most familiar with uh, Isaac Watts' hymn, We're Marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. Marching to Zion, that beautiful city of God. And so Zion is not without great significance. In fact, in the scriptures, there are songs of Zion. If you studied Psalm 120 through Psalm 134, Zion is mentioned frequently in what are known as the songs of degree or the songs of ascent. And so it would be a great Sunday afternoon study to just sit down. They're very short psalms and to read through those psalms of ascent, the Psalms of degree. A lot of people feel that it's quite possible that as people later on would make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, as they would make their pilgrimage as families to the temple, as they took steps closer and closer and as they climbed those hills, many people believe that these songs were specifically written to sing those songs as they celebrated the approach to the city of God, as they celebrated the very presence of God in their lives. That's what Zion represents. It represents the place of God. It represents the people of God. And it represents the kingdom and the eternality of our God. 
In fact, I gave you one here. You'll notice I took some excerpts from one of the great songs of Zion. It's Psalm 48. Just, I, I, if I were, typically on Wednesday nights, I've been following up the Sunday mornings with a psalm that coincides, but we have a guest speaker this week, so I'm going to give you the psalm right now. It's Psalm 48. Look at the song of Zion. Great is the Lord. Would you say that opening statement with me? Begin. Ready? Great is the Lord. One more time. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised in the what? In the city of our God. In the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. The city of the great king. Now, of course, it would come to be known as the city of King David, but we know it speaks of a king far more eternal than King David. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. Now we skip down to verse 8. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it, say it, forever. They'd sing about this city, Jerusalem. This city of Zion, this mountain city, this mountain fortress. Verse 9, we have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Verse 11, let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Notice the geographical references. Obviously, Mount Zion, you understand. But now the daughters of Judah. The daughters of Judah be glad. David was from the tribe of Judah. This is the city of David. The, 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 the tribe of Judah from which would come our Messiah Jesus. O Zion. Uh, I'm sorry. Verse number 12 Walk about Zion and go round about her. You ever notice when people get, they're proud of their city. Have you ever traveled somewhere and people are just proud of the place that they live? You know what I'm talking about? And you come and you're like, all right, what should I check out? And then, well, you got to go over here and you got to go over there. My sister Hannah is back with us today. After she's been traveling all over the country, I think, really from west to east. And I'm sure you've been a lot of places, seen a lot of things. And everywhere you go, it seems like the people want to tell you what the coolest place is to check out. We get to, my wife and I get to interact with a lot of people who are, uh, come as tourists to this area. And you know, there's so many wonderful things to tell people about. And we usually tell them, oh, you got to go, we, all the natural things. You, know, you got to go see the, the natural bridge and you got to check out the waterfall, the cascades up here. And you got to go see this. And did you come, did you come down the hairpin turn? Did you see that? You know, all the things that, oh, you got to see that, you got to see this. It can be a bit overwhelming. But think about this. Think about this psalm as the people of God talk about Zion. <laughs> like, oh, just walk around. You've just got to walk around our city. But this isn't our city. It's David's city. But this isn't David's city. This is God's city. This is the city of God. Walk round about her and tell the towers thereof. Verse 13. Mark ye well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that ye may tell it to the generation following. Why? Because what is the significance of Zion? This physical city that they thought of had eternal significance. Because look at the final verse of the psalm, verse 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. And he will be our guide even unto death. See, because Zion wasn't just about this geographical location, but it represented and it was symbolic of the relationship that God has with his people. Do you realize that God has always had a people and God has always had a place where he meets with his people? He's always had a people and always a place where he met with his people. Zion, we've seen the significance of Zion, these beautiful songs of Zion. There's one other passage that I want you to see, and again, there's over a hundred references, so we could have taken a lot longer on this, but we, we didn't. So, I, but I got to show you one more, and that, are, that, that is the shepherd of Zion. This is a beautiful passage in Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and verse number 9 through 11. O Zion, 
that bringest good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. They were to look to Zion. They were to look to that, that, that city on the hill. And they were not to say, look at the architecture, or look at this, or look at that. They were to say, that city represents our God. Look to God. Behold, this is Zion, but lift up your eyes. Behold your God. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Zion represents power, eternality, stability, glory, but it also represents relationship. It represents the, the desire that God has for his children to follow him as sheep follow the shepherd, as he is the shepherd of Zion. But that was all in the future for David and his men as they march. They didn't know what the future held. All they knew, they, they couldn't see into the ages to come. All they knew was that God had put it on David's heart that this city was to be their city. This city didn't belong to the Jebusites. This city belonged to them. And so as they approached, there must be a battle for the city. There had to be a fight because they did not knock on the gates. Excuse me, men of Jebu. Would you please let us have your city? We feel that it should belong to us now. No, they weren't going to give it up. They weren't going to give it up without a fight. And very much true, you'll see the spiritual implications of this at the end. The beautiful Zion, the eternal Zion, could not be, could not be given to us except someone had fought the battle for that mountain. We'll get to that at the end, but just kind of mark that away, that there was a battle for both the physical Zion and there was a battle for the eternal Zion, the eternal dwelling of God. Now, so let's look at the battle. So pick it up back in 2 Samuel in verse number 6 of chapter 5. So 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Now there's one detail that's not recorded here, but... You can study it later in 1 Chronicles. David throws out a challenge and says, Who will be the one to lead the charge up Mount Zion? Who will be the one to conquer the fortress? Whoever conquers this fortress, he will be my supreme commander. And you know who stepped up? Joab. You remember him. Joab is going to take this moment to become the leader of David's men. And he is the general of David that's going to lead the charge up this mountain. But now the battle is about to take place. Now, this, the text of this is a little bit confusing um, because of the references to the blind and the lame. The blind and the lame. Reading at first glance, you have to, it actually helps to look at, uh, do a little bit of study behind this and, and see how this is translated. The, the point is this. This is actually an idiomatic phrase. There were not literal blind and lame people that are being spoken about in this passage. This is what's happening. Notice who's speaking. In verse 6, it says that it's the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spake to David, and they said, except you take away the blind and the lame, you won't come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. In other words, their idea was this. Our city is so impenetrable our city is so magnificent. Our walls are so strong that we could leave them guarded by the blind and the lame. The blind and the lame could defend this city. That's what they're saying. They're saying that, that no matter, you can come up against us, you can try to fight against us, but they mock. This is a mocking term. 
And they're saying that we don't even need our best soldiers to fight this. In fact, we don't even need any soldiers. We dare you. Bring it on. And so they mock with this. Well, it says, nevertheless, verse 7, David took the stronghold of Zion. No battle description, no uh, glamorous deeds recorded. Simply the enemies of God's people saying, there is no way you can do this. This is impossible. Our city is impenetrable. These gates have never been conquered. And in such an underwhelming statement, nevertheless, David took it. He took it. He took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And now David has some words for the Jebusites, and he turns their idiom back on them. And he says on that day, in verse 8, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. So what he does is he turns the tables on them. David is not disrespecting people with disabilities here. That's not the point. The point is they have made that accusation. Well, we could defend this city with the blind and the lame. And David's going to say, oh yeah? Well, that's about what you are again, up against our forces. And he goes and he defeats them. It says in verse number... Um, uh, ver and then there was a saying that came out of it. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. There is a victory. There's a triumph. And now in with thousands of years of literally you got to put the the timing of this in place with a few thousand years of human history behind him and a few thousand years of human history ahead of him David conquers Jerusalem and Zion becomes the city of David the city of God and David triumphs that day and takes Zion well I'd like to show you one other aspect that's very important as we said that Zion has significance all throughout the scriptures. I want you to take your Bibles, and I want to show you one of the later references to Zion, and that is in Hebrews chapter number 12. So if you take your Bibles and go with me to Hebrews chapter number 12. And I'd have you look at verse number 22. Hebrews 12 and verse number 22. Now, before we read that, we've seen the taking of Zion. We know that it's filled with spiritual significance. It represents the past. That is all that God did with David. All that was written in the Psalms. All that, was, that, was, all that was, would take place in the temple. All of that's in the past, right? We understand that. There is no temple in Jerusalem today. Zion is, the, the Zion that David knew, the Zion that Solomon knew, is not the Jerusalem of today. It's, it's geographically the same place, but it does not look as it did. So in the Bible, Zion is significant of those past events. And we know that Zion also is significant of a future prophetic day. The day where the kingdom of God comes to rule and reign on earth. But Zion also has present significance for New Testament Christians today. And that is found in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Once you notice verse number 22. We talk about our spiritual Zion. It says in verse 22... But ye are come, where? Unto Mount Zion. The, the difference in spelling is simply a difference between the language of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament. It's the same, the same word. He says, but ye are come. Present reality. Now, you've got to understand the book of Hebrews is writing to Jewish believers or 
Jewish people that are on the fence of, do we follow Christ as our Messiah? Do we trust Jesus as our Messiah? Or we, do we go back into our, the, the ways of our Jewish teachings? What should we do? And to the believer, to the believer, the writer of Hebrews wants to remind them about the presence of God, wants to remind them about the city of God. And he says, present tense, ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. What he's, what, let's read some more. I'll, I'll read the whole section. To an innumerable com company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Verse 24, and to Jesus. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Verse 25, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth... Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Back to verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. You are come to Mount Zion. The past, the future, but Zion today. Zion today. What we're speaking about is a true and a better reality. Now, I didn't think I'd have time for this, but for a change, I'm actually way ahead of schedule. So let me give you just a little bit more scripture because I don't want to shortchange anybody this, this morning. You okay with that? We're going to make it? We'll be all right? Take, I, I only gave you verses 22, but to totally understand the significance of Zion, you would have to actually go back to verse number 18. I don't know if we'll be able to put it on the screen or not. That's okay. If you have your Bible open in Hebrews 12, go back to verse 18. Because what's happening here is the book of Hebrews is explaining to us that we have a better reality. We have a better reality that you say better than what? Better than what religion? Better than any religion. Particularly better than the old Hebrew Zion. Better than all of the, the, the old Hebrew tradition, we have something better and something more fulfilling, something truer in our spiritual Zion. If you go back to verse number 18, he says this, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. You say, what in the world? Ethan, what in the world is this talking about? Let me encourage you. It's why do we take time, even on Sunday mornings, to preach through the Old Testament? Because it's only through understanding the Old Testament that you have a full appreciation of all that you read in the New Testament. Have you found that to be true in your, those of you who study the Bible? So when he's speaking here, he's speaking about an event, a mountain. Is this Mount Zion? No. This is a mountain that was that you could physically touch, but it burned with fire. And there was a storm and darkness around it. Does anybody know what, what in the world mountain this would be referring to? Or what happened? Where was there an account of a mountain that smoked with fire? And if you read about it, there was an earthquake and a tempest. Does anybody know? I heard somebody say it. It was Mount Sinai. And do you know what happened on Mount Sinai? Think Moses. Moses went up Mount Sinai, and what did he receive there? You know, what did he receive there? Yeah, the commandments, the tables of stone. And God didn't meet with the people on Sinai. What did God say to the people? He said, stay away, stay away. And Moses goes up, they give Moses the Ten Commandments, and Moses, well, first time he comes down, what's he do? Smashes them. But you know, you know, most of you know the rest of the story. The point is this. They got the law on Mount Sinai. And there were tons of people when this book of Hebrews was written that were thinking, do we really need Jesus or should we go with the law of Moses? 
do we really need Jesus or should we try to earn our salvation on our own? How many of you understand that that is still a discussion that people have today? Even in quote unquote Christian churches. They say, well, do we really need Jesus or maybe we could just be really good people and keep the Ten Commandments? Do we really need Jesus or could we maybe just go into this Christian church that tells us, do this, do this, perform these religious things, and you'll be good enough to approach God? Do we really need Jesus or can we trust in our works? Do we really need Jesus or can we trust in our religion? And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you're not come. God doesn't want a Mount Sinai relationship with you. What mountain relationship does God want with you? He wants a Mount Zion relationship with you. He doesn't want you to approach him in a he doesn't want you to approach him in a place of terror and and trembling and law and and legalism. He says, and there's a bunch more that's that it says here. In fact, let's read it. Verse 18, you're not come to that mountain. Verse 19, it's not the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, which voice that they heard and treated. They said, No, we can't hear any more of these words. We can't hear, hear any more of it. Why? Verse 20. Because they couldn't endure that which was commanded. The law was too great. The religion is too oppressive. It's crushing our souls. Verse 21. And so terrible was the sight that even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. God says, that's how they knew me in the past. That's how... Religion would have you approach God. But he says, I have something better for you. I have something truer. It's not Mount Sinai, verse 22, but ye are come to Mount Zion. And they would have been reminded of all the beautiful Psalms that we were talking about a few minutes ago. They would have been reminded of all the beauty and glory of being close to God and knowing God. And the approachableness of God. And they would say, hey, you had these two mountains in your history. You had Sinai in your history and you had Zion in your history. Right now, you can approach God on Mount Zion. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I, oh, I'm sorry, verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. He's saying, listen, notice a few things in here. Notice a few things. He says, you have Mount Zion. First of all, you have a better congregation. A better congregation. He said, Look at the people that are there. Look at the people that are part of this family of God. They're not just, it's not like David's army and it's not like the Pharisees of old, but it's, it's a city of the living God. And in that city is a innumerable company of angels. And in verse 23, it's a general assembly and it's a church of the firstborn. Listen, you and I, if we know Christ, we are part of that heavenly church. We are part of that heavenly, heavenly congregation. And it is, it is described as Mount Zion. It's a beautiful spiritual truth that we have a better congregation. We've been pulled out of religion. We've been pulled out of the world. And we belong to the great company of the people of God. Do you know who you are this morning? You belong, if you know Christ, you belong to the great congregation that will gather physically together someday in the future. But today you belong to it if you know Christ. You belong to Zion. You are the people of Zion. We are the people of Zion. It's a better congregation. It says that, uh, verse 23 again, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men who are made perfect. Not because of anything what we've, that we've done, but we've been made perfect. And then look at this, verse 24, and to who? And to who? Jesus. And to Jesus. Not only do we have a better congregation, but we have a better champion. We have a better champion. Who took Jerusalem the first time? Go ahead. Who took Jerusalem the first time? David took it. But this Zion, this Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem, this eternal Jerusalem, who had to take that city? Jesus did. Jesus did. The Bible says that Jesus, he climbed another mountain. He climbed Mount Calvary, right? With Sinai in the past and the eternal Zion in the future, 
Jesus won the victory. Better than David and his men. You see, Jesus didn't send anybody else up to fight. There was no Joab to step up and say, I'll go fight it for you. I'll take this city for you. Jesus climbed the hill himself. And just like the Jebusites mocked David and the Jebusites said to David, they said, ah, this city is impenetrable. Listen, the forces of hell and the forces of evil mocked our Savior. They mocked Jesus. They said, save yourself. Call God if he will save you. They literally mocked him. But the Bible says that concerning those principalities, those spiritual demons, principalities and powers, the Bible says that Jesus made a show of them openly. He trounced them on the cross. When he cried, it is finished. He paid the price to win our eternal freedom. And when he rose from the dead, the, the cries and victories of the forces of hell were silenced once and for all as Jesus rose, the victorious son of David, triumphant over death and hell. And he has delivered to us the city of Zion. He says, it's not just mine, it's yours. It belongs to you. This is your Zion. We have a better champion. We have a better city. And we have a better covenant. Because if you notice in the scripture, it's a covenant that's made with the blood of Jesus. Zion. The city of God. Micah 4, from verses 5 and verse number 7. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Would you say that with me? And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Zion is your certainty. It's my certainty. But no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in this life, the victory has already been accomplished. The battle for the eternal Jerusalem has already been won. We will walk. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And in verse number seven, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever, forever. Zion, the new Jerusalem, yes, it's past. Yes, it's coming as certain as yesterday is our future city in New Jerusalem. But it's also a present reality today that we belong to that kingdom. That the victory has already been won. Do you walk? Are you walking in the name of the Lord your God today? Are you living in his name? Are you living as a citizen of the eternal Zion? Does your life, could your life be described as one who sings the songs and celebrates the victories of Zion? Or Christians, do we often live for lesser things? Do we often live for things of less significance? There's a future. The Lord will reign. But there's a present reality that we're called to embrace and called to live in. Are you living that experience? Don't live for the lesser things of this world. And then for those who maybe you're not sure if you've ever put your faith and trust in Jesus. You know, we've talked about a bit figuratively this morning about things. We, we're talking about an ancient city and a fortress and how that relates to our, to our Christian life. But the, the boiled simply down is this. Because of Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, I'm going to live forever somewhere. You, some call it heaven. Some call it the new Jerusalem. Today, we like, in this message, we like to call it Zion. But put very simply, God has prepared a place for those who love him. God has prepared a place for all of eternity. And that's the, the future Zion that we've spoken about today. Just a simple question. 
Do you know Jesus? Have you ever received Jesus as your Savior? Do you have an eternal home? Do you have an eternal hope? God has promised this beautiful eternity for all of His people. And it's made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose from the dead for you and for me. And we can have that certainty that when this life is over, when the end of the world comes, whichever comes first, that we will live with God with our sins forgiven forever and ever. But it's not because of David. It's because of Jesus. Have you ever put your faith and your trust in Jesus? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Once more, once more, simply put, has there ever been a time in your life that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, whether you're in this room or you're watching the video today, I'd like to invite you right now to put your faith in Christ. He did everything that was needed to purchase eternal life for you. You can't be good enough. You can't be religious enough. You can't do anything except say yes to Christ. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for me and I receive you as my Savior. Would you do that today? Pray a simple prayer, something like that. Lord, I am a sinner, but I believe you died and rose again for me. And I trust you and you alone as my Savior. Christian, maybe this morning you just need to celebrate your citizenship in Zion. Maybe you need to let go of some lesser things that are holding you back. And rejoice in the knowledge that you belong to the King and your home is in heaven. Let's take a moment as the instruments play and let's just close with quiet prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Thank you for so much this morning. I want to thank you for the power of the scriptures today. Lord, I want to thank you that your story is intricately woven from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Thank you that we can trust your word. Thank you that it's a sure foundation. Lord, I thank you that I can leave today knowing what my future is pray for my brothers and sisters here today to leave with that confidence, leave with that assurance and that motivation to live a life for your glory. God, I pray for anybody that's struggling, they're not sure that they've trusted Christ as their Savior. Lord, I pray that today that if they've not done it yet, Lord, move in their hearts. I pray that today would be the day that they call out to you in faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we prepare to sing. And I just want to say before we sing is if you are if if you're watching or if you're in the room and you we talk every week about the gospel, we talk every week about being saved and having eternal life. If you still have questions, please let me know. If you're in the room, just say, hey, I'd like to talk about that. See me after the service. See my dad or or Sunday school teacher. Say, I just want to know that that I can be saved, that I'm going to heaven. If you're watching on video, send us a message. Say, I'd like to hear more from the scriptures about how I can know that heaven is my home. Christians, let's sing this last song out. Sing the songs of Zion for the glory of the Lord this morning. as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.